Jim Muir. I'm with you at 10 o'clock tonight. Again, we appreciate you being alongside you, uh, with us tonight. The phone lines, again, open 439-4100-800-439-1063-435-8100. We are happy to welcome you to the program tonight. Jason Palmer, he is the uh, uh, Republican candidate in the 12th Congressional District, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, he is uh, running against Democrat Bill Inyard uh, for the seat vacated. Uh, by the retirement of longtime Congressman Jerry Costello, and in studio with uh, with uh, Jason Plummer tonight is uh, Congressman John Klein. He is from Minnesota. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Jim. Thanks we for having are, us. We are glad to be here. And uh, certainly with some na nasty weather blowing in here tonight, but uh, but uh, certainly uh, glad to have you alongside. You spent the day, you say, in the metro area, but uh, I know you're in Southern Illinois a lot, Jason. We're in Southern Illinois all the time, and. Uh especially enjoy coming to uh, to Franklin County. You know, I spent a lot of time in Thompsonville and West Frankfort and Bend, so it's good to be here. And uh, talk about the campaign. A, a big, a sprawling area here, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're putting off a lot of miles on a vehicle. We are. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, we passed 50,000 miles on the, on my pickup truck, which uh, I always use uh, crisscrossing the district. We've got 12 counties. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in Southern Illinois. You know, that's one thing. We hear about people uh, in Southern Illinois, they're very frustrated because they don't feel that uh, the voice of the Southern Illinois uh, uh, folks are, is really being represented in Washington. They feel that, you know, this district's kind of controlled by one county. We need to make sure everybody feels uh, that they're being represented, their voice is being heard. When you travel, and I know you've, you've knocked on doors, you've been in parades, you've been to ball games, a lot of different things. When you're traveling, what's the general theme you're hearing from voters in this area? Well, we're pretty fortunate because, you know, we are talking all the time about the fact that we need jobs in Southern Illinois. And we don't just need jobs. We need good quality jobs people can depend on. They can plant their roots, and we can grow the, the communities down here. Uh, fortunately for us, that's our message, and that's what we hear from the voters. They, they know that they need jobs. They know that we're an area tremendously blessed with coal and oil and gas and a great geographic location, but uh, we're losing those jobs, and we shouldn't be. We're, we're standing on top of a gold mine. We need to make sure that we're accessing our natural resources and, and provide an environment where, where the folks in Southern Illinois can find good jobs. And, and we continue to hear about jobs, and, and right here in Franklin County, I think the last unemployment numbers we heard were pushing 13 percent here, 12.8 percent, I believe, right here in Franklin County. Um, what's what's the remedy? It, 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 what, what do you, how do you create the jobs and get the, get us back on a level playing field, with, even with the rest of the state? Sure. Well, you're, you're exactly right. There's 102 counties in Illinois. Franklin County has the highest unemployment rate in the state. And we, of course, saw, saw the news a couple of weeks ago, another 300 jobs uh, leaving this area. What we really need to do, um, you know, when, when you're running for Congress in Oklahoma or, or Florida or wherever, you're always talking about Washington. Here in Illinois, we got two problems. we got Washington and we got Springfield. We're facing, uh, you know, headwinds from two different directions. We need to make sure that we have policies in place where our businesses and workers are in a, in a, in a competitive position. Right now, they're not. You know, in 20 years, we've gone from 37 coal mines to less than 10 coal mines here in the 12th Congressional District. Uh, if we're going to turn things around, uh, we need to follow in the footsteps of, of uh, the leadership we've seen in other parts of the country. We've laid out a 12-point jobs plan, which I, I know we've talked to you about, that really focuses on those things that, that we think will put people back to work in Southern Illinois. It talks about true tax reform. It talks about regulatory reform, getting the EPA and the Department of Labor and some of these other bureaucracies from Washington uh, out from in front of our, our farmers and our coal miners and our small businessmen, because that's what we hear on the ground. Uh, there's a lack of certainty out there. Uh, people aren't very confident in the direction of this economy. We need to uh, create an environment where there's certainty for all of the workers, and there's confidence that things can turn around, because uh, we're tremendously blessed in Southern Illinois. We're not struggling because of a, a, a lack of human talent or lack of natural resources. We're struggling because of bad public policy, and that's what we're in this race to fix. Does there have to be a, a, a complete culture change in Springfield before that happens? I think we need to see a culture change in Springfield and in Washington. And uh, that, that's why we're in this race. You know, we need to make sure the people of Southern Illinois have a voice in, in Washington and have voices in, in Springfield. And unfortunately, that's not always the case, as, as we're seeing today. I want to talk to you about several different specific ideas. Uh, we, we, have, we have had our share of negative commercials in the, in the race between you and Bill Inyard. And in one of those commercials, I heard it several times this afternoon while I was preparing for the program, you're accused of, of signing a pledge. I'm going to read exactly what it says. Signing a pledge that protected tax breaks for corporations that outsource jobs overseas and also that you want to eliminate corporate taxes, give a tax break to millionaires and make the middle class pay even more. Is any part of that commercial truthful? And if not, what is your position 
on a tax increase and, and particularly a comprehensive tax reform? Sure. Uh, none of that is true. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of things that aren't true about me, uh, from Medicare to taxes to you name it. It's really unfortunate. You know, people wonder, why does Congress have an approval rating of 14 or 15 or 16 percent, whatever it is? Well, they, they've got an approval rating like that because of politics like this. You know, we've tried to run a very aggressive campaign where we've talked about positive solutions for the problems we're facing. If you look at our jobs plan, it, it addresses tax reform, what, what I think we need to see from, from uh, a tax policy perspective. You know, we've got a federal tax code that's more than 72,000 pages and growing. We've got a U.S. Constitution that's less than 10 pages. You know, the foundation of, of our system of government, less than 10 pages. Our tax code, 72,000. You know, so we need to simplify the tax code. We need to uh, lay out a tax code. We need true tax reform. We need an environment where people feel like that they're at a competitive uh, uh, equal playing field with other folks. People need to be able to understand the tax code. We've got the highest corporate tax rates in the world. If you're a business operating in the state of Illinois, you're in the highest tax jurisdiction of the industrialized world. Okay, so uh, the tax reform that we propose brings down uh, tax rates for individuals. It brings down tax rates for corporations. It eliminates loopholes and deductions that large companies and connected individuals can take advantage of. And it lays out a tax code that, that incentivizes people to work, to invest, to save. Because right now we don't have a tax code that does that. And we feel that when we have a more simple, more fair, more flat tax code in place, it will get more people employed, more people earning a paycheck, more people paying taxes. And that's how we solve the fiscal crisis in Washington. I was talking to a, to a lady a few days ago who was talking about the fact that she's got two two sons who are who are in their teens that uh, she has no health care. Right. And and um, the the Obamacare is is law, but Mitt Romney has said that if he is if he's elected, that he'll work hard to repeal that. What is your position on Obamacare? And secondly, if that's not the solution, what is? Well, I think what you've seen, uh, a lot of Republicans around the country and some Democrats around the country, no one says, let's, let's repeal Obamacare and move on in life. What people say is, we need to repeal Obamacare and we need to replace it with something that makes sense. Uh, people in Southern Illinois have been struggling with their health care for a long time. Let's talk about why people in Southern Illinois struggle with their health care. Well, if you're in a traumatic car accident or if you have a, a, a terrible injury in Southern Illinois, where do you go for your health care, Jim? You go to Evansville, Indiana or... Paducah, Kentucky, or Cape Girardeau, Missouri, or St. Louis, Missouri. Why don't you go to one of the great hospitals we have in, in Carbondale or Mount Vernon or, or anywhere in Southern Illinois? Well, it's because of, of, of the lawsuit environment we have. I come from Madison, St. Clair County, Illinois. The trial lawyers have decimated the health care of the people of Southern Illinois. There is no tort reform in Obamacare. If you really cared about the health care of people, there would have been tort reform in Obamacare. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we put, uh, no one's arguing the health care system we have is great. We need to put policies in place that, that address the needs of our health care system. We need to make sure we bring down the cost of health care. We improve the access to health care. We improve the quality of that health care. And so the, the, there's things that we need to do. There's things that we've laid out in terms of making sure folks with pre-existing conditions have health care, making sure that nobody goes without care, making sure that we have tort reform, making sure that we put policies in place to address those issues. My problem with Obamacare is simple. It takes $716 billion away from Medicare, a program that our seniors are dependent upon, a, a program that we have people who are now retired. They've been planning their whole life with an expectation that Medicare is going to be there. And here we are gutting the program of $716 billion to fund a program that the president himself today still can't quite explain. And, and, and that's a real problem. You know, Another problem with Obamacare is it really takes a lot of the medical decisions that uh, should be made at the kitchen table or at the doctor's office between you and your family and your doctor, and it puts it, uh, those decisions in the hands of bureaucrats out in Washington, D.C., and there is nobody in Benton, Illinois, that wants bureaucrats making health care decisions for them. They want their family making health care decisions for them. I want to let, give you just a moment to catch your breath. I want to I want to welcome Congressman Klein to the program. He's traveled all the way from Minnesota, so we want to get him in here just a little bit. And I, uh, Congressman, I was looking at your bio this afternoon, kind of trying to wrap my mind around this interview tonight. And you know, you're a you were a decorated Marine, 25 years a veteran in the Marine Corps, uh, and uh, in Vietnam you were a pilot, uh, and then you decided to really jump into a war and run for Congress. What's the mind? <laughs> what's the what's the thinking there? Well, I think I decided to run for Congress for some of the same reasons that Jason did. You see a problem and you want to try to step in and bring your experience to try to fix those problems to find solutions. 
I'm so excited listening to uh, to Jason talk. He's on top of the issues. He knows what the problems are. He knows his district. He knows the communities here. And he wants to bring that knowledge and that enthusiasm to Washington. And Washington, by golly, needs it. Jason said that the congressional approval rating was about 14 or 15 percent. I wish it were that high. I thought it was single digits when he said that. I thought it was thinking maybe nine last time. Well, you you, you got to keep in mind that, that that's not a Congressman Klein's fault either. His approval rating's through the roof, you know. I think I think that was the only mistake he made in, in all that he was talking about. He gave uh, Congress too much credit, and Congress doesn't deserve an approval rating higher than that. We have been uh, gridlocked in Washington D.C. We have huge differences uh, about to, which direction to go to solve our country's problems. Uh, we've got uh, Harry Reid and Democrats in charge of the Senate and John Boehner and the Republicans in charge of the House. And some days we can come together to solve some problems. But on the big issues that Jason has been talking about, what are we going to do about health care? What are we going to do about Obamacare? What are we going to do about runaway entitlement spending? What are we going to do about the uncertainty that businesses here in southern Illinois and across the country are facing? What are we going to do about the largest tax increase in American history that's uh, impending here in January? What are we going to do about these huge defense cuts that are coming with this thing that's called sequestration? We have big problems, and we have very different ideas about how to solve them. Jason pointed out, out that, the, that the president's approach has been to create another government program or make a bigger pro government program or borrow more money or spend more money, and many of us just see that as a road to destruction. We've got to get our fiscal house in order, start taking the tough political and moral decisions to get this country fixed. And again, I'm so excited to sit here listening to Jason. I just wanted to jump up and cheer as he's talking. This is a guy we need. We need to have with us in Congress. I want to ask you one more quick question, then we're going to move back to Jason. But uh, you mentioned the the, the partisan politics in in, uh, in uh, Washington, and, and we talked about changing the culture. For a layman like me to, to, to sit back and watch what takes place in Washington, it's very frustrating, because I want to see things happen. I'm sure it's frustrating for you being there, what has to change, and I'm not going to give either party a pass here because I think both of them are guilty of, of uh, the Republicans and the Democrats are guilty of, of playing politics with a lot of issues. What has to change, Congressman, for, that to, uh, for, that to, for the climate to change? Well, you're exactly right. Republicans and Democrats can be held to blame for a lot of problems that we've seen. I'm a Republican, and I tend to hold the Democrats more, more to blame. Because I think there are huge philosophical differences as I was talking about, whether you're going to tax more and spend more and borrow more money from China, or whether you're going to try to get the, the fiscal house in order, it makes a really, really big difference in, in the hope for our kids and grandkids to have a chance. So we do have these very big philosophical differences. But, but what I think is going to change and what is changing is that the, the fiscal cliff, the crisis, if you will, is right in front of us. It is right in front of us, and if we don't muster the political courage and will to come together and address these really big issues, uh, our country is in really big trouble, and the, my hopes and dreams for my kids, and perhaps more importantly for my grandkids, uh, are, are going to be dashed, and, and that's true for Americans across the country, so we have got to come together. I think that there is no question that the election and I'm talking about the presidential election, has had us frozen for months. <clears throat> President Obama started campaigning, in my district, by the way, August of a year ago with the bus trip. And the Republicans, as everybody knows, has been in a huge primary battle. It seems like we've had more Republican debates and, and battles. We had about nine or ten Republicans running for Congress. And that rhetoric got so sharp um, that it really sort of pushed everybody into their corners. We need to get past this election November 6th. I am pulling as hard as I can, as you might guess, for Governor Romney to win. I think it's very important in turning this country around. I'm pulling for Jason Plummer to win. Uh, but we have to get past this election and then come back with these really, really big problems right in front of us and take them on. Jason, Congressman Klein mentioned the, the spending, and, and I, I, I relate to him what he's saying, uh, particularly about the grandkids. I, I'm, uh, I've got four grandkids, and three, uh, I got five grandkids, and four of them are under three years old. And so uh, uh, Christmas is a great time around the house. And just, and, but in any event, I worry about the future. Right. Right? You know, uh, I'm on the back side of my career and what I'm doing, but, but I worry about the future. And when you look at, at a, a $1.5 trillion deficit, a, a growing $16 trillion national debt, 
how do you cut spending and, and, and how do you, and what always frustrates me is that everybody wants to cut spending until they, cut, until they want to take a piece out of their pie. Right. And then, then they don't want to cut spending. How do you go to Washington and say, we've got to have a change of climate and cut spending and, and, and make, the, make the necessary cuts to get us back on, on level ground? Well, you've got to have leadership that, that's willing to, to make the tough decisions and, and do these things. You know, I, I'm a numbers guy. I, I like numbers, and I always like to just kind of paint a picture to, to groups I talk to. So, I mean, you know, for your listeners out there, the federal government this year is going to spend $3.5 trillion, $3.5 trillion. If you take Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and interest on the debt, that's $2.5 trillion out of the $3.5 trillion. So that leaves a trillion dollars for everything else the federal government does. Uh, infrastructure spending, education, military, FBI, IRS, you name it. Uh, as you said, our deficit's going to exceed a trillion dollars. So what that means essentially is we could shut down everything the federal government does except for Medicaid, Medicare, uh, interest on the debt, and Social Security, and we would still be running a deficit. And there's people in Washington that want to pretend like we're not in the middle of the fiscal crisis we're in right now. So, you know, how are you going to solve this problem when you have a president that leads from behind? How are you going to solve this problem when you have a Senate that, that won't present a budget? I mean, it's been over 1,200 days, I think, since the Senate's presented a budget. And you've got folks in the House who are presenting some things. But, you know, it, it takes everybody working out there. It takes everybody out there leading and making tough decisions to get things done. So, you know, I'm only going to be one out of uh, 435 members of the House. But I'm going to add my voice to that chorus of people who are calling for, for fiscal reform. How do you solve the problem? Well, you don't just solve it through cuts. We're obviously, there's things that we have to cut, but you also solve it by increasing the amount of revenue to Washington, D.C. And I think that's a big philosophical debate we have going on right now at the presidential level and in this congressional race. So you either, how do you drive more revenue to Washington? Well, I think you drive more revenue to Washington by lowering the unemployment rate in Franklin County, Illinois, by lowering the unemployment rate in the 12th Congressional District, you put more people back to work. You get more coal mines open. You get more coal miners working, collecting a paycheck, paying taxes. You grow the economy. You get more people participating in the process. You increase revenue. You know, John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, he, he, he utilizes philosophy, and he, he, he achieves success. Ronald Reagan, Republican, he utilizes philosophy, and he achieves success. Now, you've got the other side... Um, my opponent, President Obama, so on and so forth, that just thinks, well, let's just raise taxes on everybody. But, but as we see here in Illinois, Governor Quinn thought that we could just raise taxes and that would solve our fiscal crisis. Well, we've raised taxes, largest tax increase in state history, we, $7 billion in new revenue, and the deficit grows because we're costing ourselves jobs, we're costing ourselves companies as people move out of the state of Illinois. We don't want the United States of America to become what the state of Illinois is today. We need to make sure we have leaders that are going to work hard to make the cuts that we need to make, but also to grow the economy so more people can find quality jobs, more people pay taxes, and we increase revenue to Washington. We have a caller that wants to join us. Uh, Jerry has, uh, has called in. Jerry, welcome to the program, and uh, do you have a question for, for Jason Plummer? Yes, I would just like to make a quick point. The congressman mentioned it two times. He was for the Republican, uh, and he was he was for the Republican candidate for president, and he was for the Republican candidate for Congress. It's time to get rid of that. It's time that we pick the best person, and not the party. So you know, if you want to do something right, you want to make this country right. I'm telling the people, don't vote by Republican and Democrat. Vote vote by the person. I think Jason's got it. Wants to respond to that. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Hey, Jerry, I, I appreciate you calling in, and, and uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for the congressman. He might jump in here in a second, but I think we both agree with you a hundred percent. You know, I'm a Republican and running for Congress, I've never voted a straight ballot in my life. Uh, there's good people on both sides of the aisle. There's bad people on both sides of the aisle. But I do think uh, in this presidential race and in, in this congressional race, if you look at the very serious problems that we're facing and you look at how, how we want to solve the problems and the solutions we've laid out, I, I think that you know we're articulating a solution that brings opportunity and jobs back to Southern Illinoisans. And, and I just don't think right now those two folks are. But there's good people up and down the ballot on both parties parties, and, and I think you're exactly right. People here in Franklin County, people in Southern Illinois need to go to the ballot uh, uh, on November 6th with an open mind, and they need to check the boxes for the person that's going to bring jobs and opportunity back to Southern Illinois. And Congressman, you spent 10 years in Washington. I'd like for you to respond to that. I think, I think Jerry makes a valid point. I think that we all feel that way sometimes. No, I think that's, I think Jerry's right, and Jason. 
is right. That there are Republicans uh, who I am not big supporters of, and there are Democrats I'm not bigger, big supporters of. But fundamentally, there's a there's a difference in philosophy here now that's evidence between the two parties, and it was articulated very very well by Jason, in saying that if you want to get Southern Illinois back to work, if you want to get Americans back to work, you need to address the big issues that are facing us, this fiscal uh, cliff that's in front of us. You've got this incredible tax rate that's, uh, that's facing us. You've got uh, the energy industry in big, big trouble. We're talking about coal here in Southern Illinois, but we, need to, we have to address this issue across the board. Governor Romney one of the reasons I'm a big supporter of his was talking about the Keystone Pipeline, for example, the other night. Why in the world would President Obama keep that pipeline from bringing Canadian oil down here and helping to lower lower costs? So there, there is a difference in philosophy between the parties, and, and I would be dishonest if I didn't say I'm much more likely to support a Republican than a Democrat. doesn't mean every Republican. They're not all flawless. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I don't have some really good friends who are Democrats. All right, well, thank you very much. Jerry, we appreciate the phone call. Thank you. You know, Jim, uh, one other thing in, in regards to Jerry's comment that, that I think needs to be pointed out, is Southern Illinois uh, lives and dies off of certain industries, and one of those big industries that I am a huge, huge supporter of is the coal industry. You know, we need that coal. That coal powers America. When you turn on a light switch, you better thank a Southern Illinois coal miner. We need more coal right now. And uh, I was at the uh, Old King Coal Rally here in Franklin County a few weeks ago, and uh, a gentleman named Phil Gannett of the Illinois Coal Association spoke, and he, and he said it as clearly as, as I've heard anybody say it. You cannot support this administration and support coal because this administration is out to destroy coal. It's out to bankrupt the industry and put coal miners out of work. And, you know, my opponent is ambivalent on cap and trade, and he's, he's a supporter of President Obama. You cannot support President Obama and think that you're going to help the Southern Illinois coal industry. And, and so in regards to my race and, and, and the presidential race, I, I think they're kind of one and the same uh, to a certain degree in terms of how we're going to bring jobs and opportunity back to, to Southern Illinois and the coal industry uh, get it thriving again. You mentioned Phil Gannett. We had him on the program the, the Saturday of the rally. It was Frankfurt. Phil was with me for almost an hour on the program uh, the Wednesday night before that rally, and, and uh, he made the same comment here. And I, I want to emphasize, I guess maybe it's an editorial comment on my part, I've been preaching that same that same line, and I don't endorse candidates on this on this program. I don't, I don't come out and say I think you should go vote for this guy. I try and bring everybody on and let the let the listeners make up their mind. But in this instance, I've said the same thing. If you vote for, vote for Obama, is a vote against Illinois coal right. or against coal period? Because simply stated, you just put the facts out there. That's not a political statement. That's a matter of fact. And, and the question, I guess, that begs to be asked now. We, we talked about before we went on the air the EPA regulations. Lisa Jackson, the head of the of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the, the, the regulations and the restrictions are just they're just uh, stringent uh, and and they're they're geared so power plants can't be built. How do you go if you're elected, Jason? How do you go to to Washington and change that mindset? Perhaps of those who are who have been part of the Obama administration and believe in that. How do you change that? Well, ho hopefully we're dealing with a new administration. But but look, there's going to be that mindset embedded out there. It, it's not just. I mean, it's a huge problem on the industries that drive Southern Illinois. We can talk about the Department of Labor uh, trying to regulate whether or not 15 or 16 year old kids can work on the family farm. There's a lot of family farms in Southern Illinois. We can talk about the EPA regulating how much coal or how much dust a, a combine kicks up. Or we can talk about, of course, what Lisa Jackson has done to the coal industry, which has been absolutely devastating. Well, we need to send folks that are going to stand up for the coal industry. You know, take uh, for example what Congressman John Shimkus has done. You know, he's fought tooth and nail against some of these regulations. Congressman Klein here is chairman as we were talking before, of a very important committee that, that oversees a lot of these things. We need people in government. We need elected officials that are going to lead on this issue. And right now, we just don't see it. We can't have bureaucrats. We can't have uh, these, these career bureaucrats at, at these different federal agencies that, that have so much impact that can essentially uh, destroy an industry without legislative action. That's one of my big problems with this administration. If you look at social issues, things that they can't get done at the ballot box, things that they can't get done legislatively, they try to go to the courts to get it done. If you look at fiscal issues,
issues and economic issues in the coal industry. They know that they failed on cap and trade. They tried hard, but they failed on cap and trade. And they failed on some of their other policies legislatively. So then they go to the EPA and these other um, uh, agencies out there, and they try to get done what they couldn't get done at the ballot box. They try to get that done through these, these giant federal bureaucracies, and we need to push back on all those things. Uh, talk also, uh, there, there's, a, there's a, maybe it's a misconception, but there's a conception that uh, Republicans particularly, maybe you, maybe you in general, uh, um, anti-labor, that, that Republicans are anti-labor. Talk about how, what's your stance on unions and, and, and right to work? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny you, you bring that up because, you know, I, I've had some, some folks in, in, in labor say, well, what do you think about right to work? And you, if you remember, I ran in a primary for this office. Right. Um, there was a three-way Republican primary. Uh, the National Right to Work Committee endorsed my two opponents, and they sent out mail pieces attacking me because I wouldn't sign their pledges and I wouldn't do their stuff because that that's not you have to represent your district, and that's not Southern Illinois. So, you know, and the, any labor organization, any union I've sat down with, uh, we get along great. Uh, things are going well. I, I get frustrated sometimes when folks won't sit down with you, but I can tell you I've got 12 county coordinators. Five of my 12 county coordinators are AFSCME members. They're prison guards, you know. I've got I've got one county coordinator that works in a coal mine. So, uh, in terms of labor, look, I'm with them a hundred percent. I think you're right. There's a perception out there sometimes that that uh, there's a, a disconnect between Republicans and labor. I would argue the disconnect is more between labor leadership and labor membership. Because let me tell you, the UMWA can go out and endorse my opponent, but my opponent's going to support policies that put coal miners out of work. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. I have I have a, a, an issue with that myself. I, I looked through the I got a UMWA journal. I looked through it, and there was 177 candidates in Illinois in the General Assembly, and, I, and 175 of them were Democrats and endorsed by the UMWA. Two Republicans out of 177 were endorsed, yeah. and I thought I don't know how you can go through 177 candidates, candidates and not find more than two. Well, I mean, but, but, but something's not right there. Well, if you look at economic policy, anybody that's that's in the look, if you're losing your job or if you're unemployed, I don't care if you're union or non-union. We need to find you a job. And so, on economic policies, I, I don't care if you're union or, or non-union. You have to support this campaign because we've laid out a vision for putting people back to work. But then let's also talk about you know uh, other issues that are important to, to union members, your listenership out there. I mean, let's look. Let's talk about traditional marriage. Let's talk about uh, abortion. Let, let's talk about gun rights. Let's talk about all those issues that are very near and dear to these people. Look, I'm endorsed by the Gun Owners of America. I'm endorsed by the Illinois State Rifle Association. I'm endorsed by the National Federation of Right to Life. I'm endorsed by all of these groups. And I guarantee you, as I'm going through this list, there's a lot of union folks right now listening, checking that box, saying, well, I agree with Jason. I agree with Jason. I agree with Jason. And um, that perception needs to be erased because when it comes to putting people back to work and when it comes to representing Southern Illinois values, uh, Jason Plummer is going to get that done in Washington, D.C. My opponent will not. He is lockstep with President Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and he's going to put more people out of work. What, what's your thoughts on the, uh, and I'm going to shift a little bit away from the, from issues, but talk about, I think you're scheduled for a debate Friday night, is that correct? Yes, yes. The fifth one? Uh, fifth debate, Do yes, you sir. just feel like you're beat to a pulp when you get through with those? No, I feel that we come out of debates looking pretty good. I, 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 mean, I love yeah, But it's just a constant battle, isn't it? It, it, it is a constant battle, but it's an important battle. Uh, the people of Southern Illinois deserve to know where their candidate stands on the issues. Um, you know, as I tell people all the time, you know, how can you hide from the voters and then expect them to vote for you? How, you know, if you're not going to go talk to somebody when you're asking them for your vote, how are you going to treat them when you're uh, an elected official? So, as you know me, I don't think there, there's how many ball games we ran into each other at. You know, several. I've seen you at football games. I, I saw you at the baseball playoffs. Uh, Vandalia. Yeah, in Vandalia. Vandalia. You know, I mean, uh, I am out there all the time. I do meet and greets. I do town halls. One of the best town halls we did was right here in Franklin County in Thompsonville. You know, we had a standing room only. We had to open the side doors. People were kind of standing on the outside, you know, listening in because we go everywhere. We meet people. We talk to people. Uh, and it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. People feel like their voices are not being heard. They feel that the issues that impact them, positively or negatively, aren't being addressed. And uh, if I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. and represent people, I darn better well know what they're concerned about and what issues impact them. And so anytime I can debate my opponent, uh, you know I'll debate them. Uh, we've accepted a lot of debates that, that my 
on his not accepted. Um, so uh, anytime I can talk to people, listen to people, and, uh, and and let them know where I stand, I do it. In conclusion, I, I always, uh, I think I've, I may have done this with you before, I always like to give an ad away uh, on this radio station. If you could address the folks, uh, and we've got a nice range here on this station. We've got about a about an 80 mile radius of Benton, so we we're going to take in the biggest part of the of the 12th congressional district. If you would talk to the voters right now that are that are that are listening, in, why should they vote for Jason Plummer? Well, I think that uh, voters listening right now should should vote for Jason Plummer because I, I'm going to represent them. Uh, this district's only had two congressmen for 72 years, and um, this is a district that's hurting. Uh, we've got double-digit unemployment rate. Franklin County, highest unemployment rate in the state of Illinois. Well, Perry County, Williamson County, Jackson County, Jefferson County, th those areas aren't doing too hot either, it, it, but they should be. We're tremendously blessed with resources. We're tremendously blessed with, with great people, uh, good, hardworking people, but they're struggling. They're struggling because of bad policies. We have laid out a jobs plan that we think is very detailed and, and very succinct in addressing the issues that impact the people of Southern Illinois. And um, on top of uh, offering solutions to getting people back to work, in, in addition to standing up to this administration and its war on coal and standing up to this administration, and quite frankly, on its war on the values of the people of Southern Illinois, oh, no one's going to outwork us. Uh, this election cycle is too important to sit on the sidelines. We have huge problems we're facing. We've got foreign policy problems. We've got a fiscal crisis. But here in Southern Illinois, we've got a jobs crisis. And I would say we've got, uh, we're overtaxed and underrepresented. And my goal going to Washington, D.C. is to shrink the size and scope of the federal government. I believe in Southern Illinois because I believe in the people of Southern Illinois. If we can get more coal miners uh, uh, mining coal, if we can get more doctors treating patients, if we can get more teachers teaching kids, if we get some more small businessmen starting businesses, employing people, providing services and products, Southern Illinois will thrive once again. But right now, Washington, D.C. has its boot on the throat of Southern Illinois. Washington, D.C. has been taking it to Southern Illinois for far too long. I'm in this race to win it and to take Southern Illinois to Washington, D.C. Very good, Jason. We appreciate that. And Congressman Klein, uh, the, the campaign trail in, in Southern Illinois, is it similar to the campaign trail in, in, uh, in Minnesota? Every, every place is a little bit different, Jim. But, yeah, the, the, the problems uh, tend to be the same. People are out of work. People are worried. Businesses are uncertain. Businesses are afraid to hire. Uh, so I, I hear a lot of the same things. I was in Indiana yesterday, Illinois today. I'll be in Iowa tomorrow and the next day back in Minnesota. And the, the people in America are worried. And so that's why I'm just thrilled to sit here and listen to Jason, somebody who is, knows what he wants to do, knows what needs to be done, is excited about doing it, full of energy. That's, that's what we need. We appreciate your time tonight, both of you. Thank you. Uh, that's Jason Plummer, a candidate for the uh, 12th Congressional District, and also Congressman John Klein from Minnesota with us tonight on Sound Off. Let's get a quick break in. We'll come back after these very important messages.